The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Well, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to him, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. I want to begin by thanking Scott for a wonderful opening to Romans. Uh, he's a lawyer, so I can't argue with him to tell him not to do that, you know. <laughs> it was brilliant. It was great. It was great because we're going to talk about Romans today, and I love the whole me, me, me aspect of it because that's exactly right. So Romans was written around the year 55. Paul was writing this letter to the people in Rome, and Paul had never visited there. So this is the first interaction that he's going to have with them, and a lot of scholars think that he was writing to them so that way they would get to know him, so when he does show up, they would accept him, all right? So he's writing to them around the year 55, and, 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 and Scott's right. There was some division happening there. There were some problems that were going on. Um, uh, there was divisions between Jews and Gentiles trying to worship together. Uh, they had certain calendar issues, certain dietary issues, and so Paul's writing to help them out, but there's a reason why they've gotten to this place where they're not able to, to worship together. So the church had been going on there for 10 to 20 years, even before Paul wrote this letter. Jews and Gentiles were coming from Jerusalem all the way into Rome and back and forth, and they were establishing the church there. But then this emperor Claudius came into power around the year 49, and he didn't like the Jews too much, and so they just tried to, to leave Rome. And so now all of a sudden you have this group of, of, of Gentiles that are Christians, this new church, little house churches that are beginning, and they're doing worship the way that they know how now and the best way that they know how. And the Jews, meanwhile, are no longer in Rome. Well, Claudius dies in 54, and the Jews start to return, and that's when the problems start having, happening. Because their understanding of how to worship, these Jewish people understand how to worship, they want to go this one way, eating these certain types of foods, celebrating on certain calendars, saying certain words. But the Gentiles now have been doing this for five or six years all by themselves, saying, no, we're now eating this, and, and, and we're going to celebrate on this day, and we're going to do it this way. And so they're going back and forth. They're not able to find that middle ground, find a way to do this together. And so Paul is writing to them, basically telling them to stop it, get away from the me, me, me. And let's get to the us kind of aspect of it. And so he says these brilliant words from our, from our letter that we have from the Romans. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind to discern what is the will of God. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. These two words, conform and transform, they carry a lot of weight to them. Now, we use those in everyday language. The kids, when they hear transform, they immediately think of transformers. I get it. I do too. But both of these words meant something a little bit different back then. To conform mean that you were going to um, um, assume something that is similar a form by practicing a same pattern of way of doing something. So to conform, which if you think about Jewish tradition, they would conform to their ancestors, to following a certain pathway, to reading a certain way, to listening a certain way, to eating a certain way, to wash their hands a certain way, to celebrate on certain days. And so these were patterns for them to follow. And they would. They would fall into this way of living. But the Gentiles also had a way of conforming too. They now found that, well, some of those things we don't necessarily need to do anymore because the Messiah has come and now we're Christians and, and we don't necessarily need to go and do these different things. So why are we doing those? And all of a sudden they come back together and the Jews are wanting the Gentiles to conform and the Gentiles are wanting the Jews to conform and that's when it has that, that whole explosion. But Paul tells them to transform. Now transform, for us, of course, we think of all kinds of different stuff, but back then it meant to be changed from being with someone or something. It's a change that happens from being with someone or something. And what Paul is getting at here is that you are changed by being with Christ, by being with each other. 
and we can transform the way that we're thinking, our minds can be renewed, and we can discern what is God's will for us. But if we're caught up in conforming to the ways of the world, then we're caught up in the selfish ways of being. And Paul knows an awful lot about transforming, doesn't he? Can you name a time in the Bible where Paul went through a transformation? What happened? Do you remember? The scales fell from his eyes. Yeah, absolutely. He has been transformed. He had that lightning bolt moment. We don't all get that. Some of us are a little bit more educational. It takes us a long time to get there. We're going to work in progress. That's me. That's all of us kind of sitting in here. But Paul also knew about Peter. Peter went through a major transformation all throughout the Gospels, and that's what our Gospel lesson on Matthew is from today. Jesus is sitting with all the disciples, and He looks at them and He says, who do people say that I am? And they say, oh, they say you're Elijah or John the Baptist or Jeremiah, and that would make for a great sermon because those are some really cool names and a lot of history there. But Jesus looks at them and says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter, at this point in time in the story, is like, I know this! I got it. You're Jesus. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of the living God. You're the anointed one. You're it. You're it. I got it. And he's absolutely believing it so much. And then Jesus looks at him and says, you're right. You're right, Simon. And now your name's going to be Peter. All of a sudden, even his name is transformed to something new. And Peter literally translates from the Greek is rock. And then Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. And Peter is transformed. But Peter's been on a journey to get to this place where he's finally agreeing and understanding of what's going on. You remember his story. I know you do. Peter's with Andrew when he's called Simon. They're on the shore. Jesus comes over and says, hey, y'all want to go fishing for people? And they said, let's do it. And they follow Jesus. And then they're on the lawn. And Jesus is talking about all these beatitudes and blessed be the poor in spirit and the hunger and thirst for righteousness and the meek. And they're looking at each other going, he is saying some really old stuff, but in a new way. This is really interesting. And then they go to Peter's house where his mother-in-law is sick, and Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law right in front of him miraculously. He's now witnessed a miracle. And then later on, Peter's with the disciples, and Jesus looks at them and says, you're going to be able to heal people. You're going to be able to feed people. You're going to be able to chase out demons. I'm giving you this authority to do so. And no sooner does that happen that he finds himself in another lawn with 10,000 of their closest friends. And he's like, they got to leave. There's not enough food here for them. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, you have the authority. You give them something to eat. And all of a sudden, there's loaves and there's fish and it's abundance everywhere. And then what happens after that? Peter gets on a boat with his friends and they start going across the sea and it's rocking all over the place. A couple of weeks ago, Jesus comes walking right toward Peter. And Peter sees him. He's like, it's Jesus. Can I come with you? And Jesus is like, of course you can. Come out in the water. And Peter goes out and it's like there's a miracle. Peter is walking on water until he gets scared and then he starts to sink. And that's when we find ourselves at today's story. All of a sudden, Peter's moved. He has seen it. He's experienced it. He has watched this thing happen. He knows without a doubt in this moment that Jesus is the Messiah. And I would love to say that Peter is perfect from there on out. But it's not true, just as much as any one of us. Because soon after this, he's up on a mountaintop with Jesus, and he sees Elijah and Moses, and he's like, hey, let's stay here. Let's build some houses up here and just stay here. This is great. Jesus is like, no, we got to go back down. Then they're down, on the, down walking around again. And he's like, hey, Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive someone? <laughs> Jesus is like, hey, Peter, it's like 77 times. He's like, man, that's a lot of times. I don't know if I can do that. Does seven work? No, 77. And then he follows him into Jerusalem. And he sits around a table as Jesus transforms an entire meal and looks at Peter and says, you're going to deny me. Even though you believe, you're going to deny me. And then Jesus is arrested, Peter denies, Jesus is crucified, and he is resurrected, and he appears to Peter and the twelve and says, go and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, go and fish for people. And Peter does. So this educational variety of transformation of Peter is kind of the thing that I think I can relate to. I've never had that burning bush moment where all of a sudden I'm just going from one place to another. But that word transform literally means metamorphosis. It means transfigured. It means we are changed. We are changed from being with someone. And Jesus looks at these disciples in this story and says, this is the rock on which the church is built. And I don't think he's talking about the person Peter. No offense, Peter. But uh, I, don't think he's, I don't think he's talking about this person. 
I think he's talking about this transformation that happens within us as we grow, as we see Christ in others, as we discern God's will. That's the rock on which the church is built. That's how the church was established and moved through. If we're going to rely on a person to keep the church moving and going, it's not going to last, is it? But something spiritual is happening, and it happens all the time. And you all have been transformed left and right. And you may not realize it, but I'm going to give you a couple examples. How many of y'all have ever um, uh, gotten a phone call from that old friend that you haven't talked to in so long? And as you, the phone rings, and they pick up the phone, like, oh, my gosh, it's you! Yay! And you just talk like you didn't miss a beat. And it's for hours on end, you know what I'm talking about? Or maybe you're having coffee with that friend, and you just, it's, the time just escapes. And when it's over, you don't even remember what was going on, any issues you had, any, any things that were troubling, or it doesn't even matter. You don't even know what time it is. You just feel that you are transformed. They have become a part of you. You become a part of them. It also happens whenever we're sitting with someone that's really dealing with a lot of struggles in their life, and you enter into their pain, you enter into their issues, Maybe they're dealing with divorce. Maybe they're dealing with the death in the family. Maybe they're depressed about some reason. Maybe they're addicted to something, and you just sit with them, and you enter into that space with them, and you're present with them, and you can see Christ in them and their struggle and their issues. You are transformed in those moments because when you leave, you take them with you, don't you? You probably don't even remember what you were upset about hours beforehand either. You're transformed. It's a change that happens by being with. And what Peter's getting at, I mean, Paul's getting at today is that when we are with Christ, we are transformed. And I don't know about you, but I don't like to be transformed. I would much rather be conformed. I want you to conform to me. I want the traffic to conform to me. I want the H-E-B line to conform to me. I want the church to conform to me. I want my family to conform to me. I want politics to conform to me. I want the Dallas Cowboys to conform to me. But all that is is self-will. That's all mine. That's all me. And at the end of the day, even if that was to happen, I'm not going to be happy. I'm not going to be spiritual. I'm not going to be thinking about anybody else but me, me, me. Me, me, me. Not the us. Today we're being invited to be transformed, to go through that change by being with. And maybe we start off in this room for this hour being changed by being with Christ, singing and praising and praying and listening and sharing and giving. Maybe for this hour we get to have that experience of being transformed with Christ. But as we go out into the world, we're invited to be transformed by seeing Christ in the world around us and the people that are around us and allowing that to transform us as well, to be with others, not to argue and bicker over what we're going to have for dinner or what date it's going to be or what color the carpet's going to be in the narthex. We're going to be with each other. So now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and guard our minds on Christ Jesus. Amen.